Welcome to the Grand Point Church Podcast. I'm your host, Crystal Stein, and today we're jumping into our final message in our Made to Be series called Made to Be Love. Today's message is a summary of all the commandments in the Bible and is the secret to keeping all of them. While you're listening, we would love to connect with you on Instagram at Grand Point Church. Let us know there why you love podcasts and how you've been encouraged by one recently. Feel free to take a selfie while you're listening to this podcast and send it to us so we can be encouraged too. If you'd like to follow along with today's message from Pastor Kevin Elworth, our feature verses come from Matthew 22, 34 to 40. Man, is it not just a refreshing and amazing for God to be over everything in your life? Oh my goodness. Thank you, Aaron, backing me up, man. Man, you need, you need that. I, feel, I Honestly, I feel like we could just stay in like that worshipful zone for the rest of the morning, yeah? Ah, man, yeah. So, can we uh, shout out and say hi to the 35, 40 people that are watching online this morning? Yeah. That's pretty good. That's pretty amazing. We're so thankful that you guys are hanging out with us. I got some stuff just for you for online campus, so hang out with us um, for the duration of this. I want to, um, I told you before, this is not a sermon. This is just a conversation, so let's just talk together for a little while today. I want to, um, the, the part of the Bible that we're going to get to today is Matthew chapter 22, and as I, I was as I was looking through this in the context surrounding it, um, it just kind of overwhelmed me, like the sense where Jesus was just constantly trying to help people understand like the depth of his care for them have you like have you seen that joe's got it he's got this down like as you like look through the word of god can you sense and can you see like the care and compassion of jesus for people it's just undeniable isn't it like every word that came out of his mouth, every action that he did, everything, even like the harsh words towards people were all in either defense of somebody else or he was just helping them try to get them to understand like, listen, I really, really care about people. I really, really would go to, to ex- incredible lengths to help them. And, and then you see these people who are, they're in this tension moment because um, whether we like it or not, and and like, hear me out. I try to say sing, some things every once in a while to just, like, catch you off guard and be like, what, like, what did he just say? Just to make sure that you're still listening. But there are people, all of us, at some way, shape, or form, are, we're really trying to one-up somebody else, aren't we? And that's where you're like, where, like, no, because if you did, you'd try to be one-upping the person next to you. I get it. Let's just claim it and move on. But... We live in a cutthroat world where we're just jockeying for position all the way through life. It's all about position. And we see this like, we see this in the Bible. You got these two groups of people, Pharisees, Sadducees, and they're always trying to one up the other. Like they, they had different sets of beliefs. They were essentially different denominations. They were walking in the same direction, but they had some variations and they were all trying to be like, you know, um, we're better than you or we're more important than you. And then Jesus walks into the scene and he's totally different than all of them. He, he says that, you know, he came to fulfill the law and they're all about the law. And so that puts them in a different position. And what do we do with this? And, and so they're constantly trying to make Jesus look bad so that they can make themselves look good. Do, do we understand it now? We're constantly trying to one up somebody else. And when Jesus walks onto the scene and he becomes the fulfillment of all these promises and he starts healing people and he just expresses this radical love, something that these Pharisees and these Sadducees, these religious people couldn't ever do. They look at him and they're like, we don't have a description for who this guy is. We just need to make him look bad. And all through their lives, all they did was try to make Jesus look bad. I believe um, you and I, positions, you need to understand this, where we feel like we're jockeying for position here, positions don't mean anything when we get to heaven. It means nothing. It, it literally means nothing. I, positions, um, it won't matter what you have gathered, what position you have perfected. In fact, I believe there will be people in heaven um, who will enjoy the accolade of admonishment from a Savior uh, who says, man, I saw what you did. I watched what you did. I watched how you reacted. 
Um, more so for that person than a president or a king who enjoyed every luxury that you could imagine here. Can we understand that? You know, I know that the picture that we receive in heaven, the picture that is described to us in the Bible, uh, is one of just unending and eternal worship in heaven, right? Is that not wonderful, right? So good. Um, I, but I do believe that there's also this element of God that, uh, and Jesus and the Trinity that he wants to give you credit for what he saw you do on earth. That's what we would do as a father, right? As a, as a parent, you want to admonish your children. You want to encourage them. How, how do we not think that's going to happen in heaven? It's, it's, it's going to be there. I guarantee you it's going to be amazing. Um, it's far more po- important that you and I are focused on our future of, e- of eternity than an everyday present. His disciples are no different. In fact, um, Jesus, they constantly were asking Jesus, hey, um, which one of us is the coolest, right? You've heard me say this before. Um, they're either asking Jesus this or they're on this road and they're walking down this road and they're talking to each other, hey, would, who, like, do you think it's me today? John back here, I mean, he's one of the three brown noser. He's got to be one of Jesus' favorite. It's going to be like when he gets to heaven, right hand, left hand, that's awesome. It's, it's going to be us, right? I mean, they've got to be, they've got to think that. They were the 12 chosen disciples that Jesus himself handpicked them, prayed over this, spent all night in pursuit of these 12 guys, and he handpicks them. I mean, that's got to mean something, right? He, he actually does say that it means something. But then where does that leave us? Does that leave us just like way in the back in the fringes? You know, the end of humanity, you get farthest away. Like, what is this? The, the reality is that you and I still wrestle with this question like, God, do you think I'm cool? Like, I come to church for Pete's sake. Let's thank God it's a little bit cold today because if it was yesterday, half of you'd be gone, right? It, we came to church today. Listen, summer's coming. I get it. Here's what we're going to do. One of the things that, you know, pause for a minute. Time out. One of the things we're working on as our church staff is how to embrace our online culture to give you the freedom to just not be here. Because so many of you are just going to be like, listen, for the two weeks that we have nice weather in Pennsylvania in the summer, I'm not coming. (laughs) And I want to be able to help you with that, okay? Like, I don't want you to be like, I wasn't in church all summer. That's why we have online church. I thought you guys would be excited about that. <laughs> All right, let's get back, back into track here. Um, this story that we're going to check out from Matthew today as we wrap up this series, Made to Be, uh, is looking at where Jesus said, listen, this is the most critical thing that you need to know. This, it all boils down to this one thing. You need to know this thing. This is no surprise. You, you know this is what this is. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is super close to his time where he's going to die. He's already walked into Jerusalem. Um, the people have already shouted Hosanna. And, and he's in these like final moments of his, of his time on, the, on this earth. And there's these two groups of people, Pharisees, Sadducees, are trying to pin Je- something on Jesus. And, and Jesus is in this like story mode. And Jesus has been talking to them through stories for a little while now. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 28, uh, these aren't on the screen. I'm just going to go through these quick. But in 21, 28, Jesus said this, tell, tell me what you think about this story. And he goes on, a man had two sons, and uh, he went to the first and said, son, go out for the day and work in the vineyard. So in that story. And then in verse 33, the same chapter, here's another story. Listen closely. There was a man who had a wealthy, a wealthy farmer who planted a vineyard, and he goes on and tells a story. In verse number 45, it says, when the religious leaders heard this story, they knew it was aimed at them, and they wanted to arrest Jesus and put him in jail. But intimidated by public opinion, they held back. Most people held him to be a prophet. In verse one of chapter 22, it says Jesus responded to them by telling more stories. You, you get this idea. He's a storytelling God. And when I came to this message today, I, it became apparent to me that you don't preach this passage of scripture from 34 to 40. You just tell stories about it. Let me re- read this passage of scripture to you. It says this in verse uh, 34 of Matthew chapter whatever, 22. When the Pharisees heard how he had bested the Sadducees, they gathered their forces for an assault. See, again, we're trying to one-up somebody else. One of their religious religion scholars spoke for them, posing a question they hoped would show him up. Teacher, 
which command in God's law is the most important? Which is good for them to know, this is good for us to know. And Jesus said this, love the Lord your God with all your passion, prayer, and intelligence, right? With all of your energy. Can, can we deny that? Can we argue with that one? This is not a trick question. Can we argue with that? Is that, a, is that an important command? Sure. I mean, Jesus said it. Good Lord. Yeah. This is the most important first thing on any list, but there is a second set alongside it. Now, I want you to gain some imagery here. Like, look at the picture. Jesus isn't saying that there's number one and number two. He's like, there's number one and then there's number one. He's putting these on the same level. Love God with all your energy and then love others as well as you love yourself. These two commandments are pegs. Everything in God's law and the prophets hangs on both of them. Am I right? You with me? Okay. I'm going to wrap this up at the end and, and recenter on Matthew chapter 22 for just a few minutes. But for the, the bulk of my eight minutes today, I want to tell you some stories. And so just recently I read this book, and like shameless plug for this book, y'all need to read this. This is called Everybody Always by Bob Goff. I read this in like three days, and it, it was, I couldn't put it down. It was so good, just so mesmerizing. Bob Goff has an incredible sense of humor, and uh, is just an, a great author. And in, in, I, at the end of the book, you're just like, I want his life. I want to be able to do what he does, right? And um, the, the issue is this, is that he doesn't do anything catastrophic. He just loves people. And it was so mesmerizing to me. In fact, I've read uh, one of the chapters in this book several times now, and like by the end of the chapter, I'm just like weeping. I know you all think that's strange of me, but I tend to be a bit of a crybaby lady. I don't know why. It's not my wife's fault. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell one of his stories in this book, and then uh, uh, I got some of my own stories from Mexico. That's why you guys came today, right? Anyway, one of the stories that he talks about in this book is um, a lady who moved into um, their old house. They owned a house and sold the house and then moved right across the street. Um, and he, he actually talks about the idea of like not selling the house to just anybody. He's actually, he was like, we, we set up a system where we were interviewing a new neighbor. He's like, we want to have great neighbors. So we were interviewing people that were going to be, you know, able to buy our house. And, and so he said they ended up selling it to this lady named Carol. And, and they formed a great relationship with this, this lady and um, just a great friendship. And he said at one point, you know, there was this like formal barrier between the, the, the families. And, and so it wasn't like, you know, they, she didn't feel comfortable, like go across the street and ask for sugar or call on the phone. So he's like, I did something that, you know, everybody is able to, you know, when you have walkie talkies, you just talk. So he's like, I went to Radio Shack and I bought walkie talkies, one for us and one for her. And, and so we would just talk on the walkie talkies. And I, that's just the coolest thing. But um, one of, one of his stories in his book is that uh, every year, New Year's Day, they throw, they have a parade through their neighborhood that his family throws. And um, he says, he said, it's just so cool because every, every new, it's like un, unrehearsed or unplanned. We just get up and we do it. And there's always balloons, balloons, hence the balloons today. Um, but he said, we fill up like a thousand balloons and, and we just walk through the neighborhood, all of our neighbors together. And he said, it started with like six people. And now every year we have like 500 people that are on this parade with us through our neighborhood. And, and he said, every year we choose a, uh, a queen of the parade. And so we chose Carol one year, and it's like an honor. And he said, he, he jokingly says, like, like, every once in a while, you'll see somebody bowing down to Carol on, this, on the corner of the street because she was the queen of the parade. And um, through this heart-wrenching story, he tells that, I mean, I wish that I could do it justice, but um, he, uh, he talks about how Carol, how Carol got cancer, and she uh, wasn't sure she was going to be able to make it to the parade for this last year, I mean, it was really looking grim for Christmas, and they weren't sure she was going to make it all the way through, and um, I caught to this this moment where she wasn't going to be able to go, but they uh, had rerouted their entire parade to stop at her house. At the very end of the parade was it just in her house, and they set up a chair for her in the window where she could just greet all of these people, 500 people, to come and just say hi to her, and like two weeks later, she passed away, and at that point, I just weep every time. It's just so heart-wrenching, but it just 
clearly communicates a picture of love and compassion for somebody. This woman owed them nothing, and, and they owed her nothing. But just because she was made in the image of God, hello, let's go all the way back to the beginning of this series, she deserved something. She deserves something from us as humans, right? Like, let me just read this verse for just one more time. That's the second slide, if you just throw that back up there one more time. Jesus says this. He says, love others as well as you love yourself. So most of you are more familiar with the translation that says, love your neighbors. Neighbors. And so uh, let's just identify the fact that um, a neighbor is a person in your proximity. If you encounter a person, they're now your neighbor. I love one of the things that Bob Goff says in this book is that um, we don't live on earth. We just live in a really large neighborhood. Whoa. Last game changer now. That just totally blows my mind about how to think through this. In, in our neighborhood, we've started thinking through some of these things too. In, in the house that we live in, um, it's really kind of unique, the neighborhood that we live in. The house that we own uh, was built by the, the, the people who lived in it before us were the people who built the house. And then um, they, they left. They Actually, they passed away. And so this house fl- sat foreclosed for like three years before we bought it. And when we moved into the neighborhood, we're like this brand new young family. Everybody else on the block, same story. They built their house. They've stayed there for life. So we're like the new kids on the block. And they're all looking at us like, what are, you're wrecking our neighborhood right now. You brought children. <laughs> now, I think they silently love and hate it at the same time because we're like noisy and tear up stuff, and my fence falls down, and it stays there for a month, that kind of thing. Um, but we started, like, encountering our neighbors, and, and we, um, there's this one sweet old lady that lives around the bend from us, and it used to be that our, the bus stop was right in front of her house. And so our kids would walk down there in the morning, to get on the bus and, uh, and off the bus, and they've since moved the bus up to right in front of our house because, I mean, let's face it, we're the house on the block with kids, so they might as well stop in front of our house, right? So, um, besides, we just kind of know people. <laughs> I know, just kidding. Um, but they used to, and, and she was so protective of our kids on the bus. She'd like, she'd finger the neighbors, you need to slow down. Kids right here, getting on the bus. She was like defensive, like, like she just self-proclaimed grandma of the neighborhood. It was so good. And every time we like walk around, you know, just we're taking a walk or riding our bikes or whatever, and she just stopped and talked to us. She just, was, she just wanted to be around people. And so last summer, some of you remember this, we had a, uh, a movie night at our house in our backyard. You know, some of you were there. It was before we actually launched this location. We just wanted to get the church together. And, and so many of you came and, and just hung out with us. And so we actually invited the neighborhood to come and hang out with us too. And some of us did. And, and so Austin went down earlier in that afternoon and knocked on her door and, and, and told her what we were doing. And she was like, yeah, I'd be glad to come. That'd be awesome. And so movie time. And she, he walks down and escorts her back. And and uh, she's all up in her Phillies, Phillies garb. This lady is like a Phillies freak, man. She loves the Phillies. Can I get a witness? Any Phillies fans in here? One? I know there's another one. Mike Pensinger, Phillies fan. Like that. Is that it? Is that all we've got? No love in here from the Phillies. Anyway, she comes down, and we get her set up, and she... I mean, like, you, you all that were there, like, you all just embraced her, made her part of the church family that day, and uh, I remember talking to her, and she's like, I gotta be back home by 9 o'clock, the Philly plays tonight, <laughs> so good. and she was, like, religious about it, but I loved watching our kids just take ownership over the neighborhood grandma. It was so good, and she still has that moment. It's, it's, it's intriguing now, because as, as our neighborhood grows older, their spouses are dying, and uh, we get we have this unique opportunity to just, to just love on our neighborhood in a way that is so incredible, and we can either take it or we can leave it. One more story I want to tell you from Mexico. So I remember this, this thing. Um, we travel a lot, back and forth, back and forth, and what, ha- what would happen is, is because it's so, at the time when we lived there, I'm not sure it still is, but at the time we lived there, it was so intensely dangerous for you to travel um, through the country, we would have to make the trip from the border to our home in one day, 500 miles. And I know 500 miles isn't crazy, but um, we only had one kid at the time, so that's a piece of cake. 
but on Mexican roads and uh, just the culture that you do deal with there, 500 miles can feel like a lot. So um, we would get up early, early in the morning, like five o'clock in the morning and, and try to make it home before dark. And so we would, and, and so we got there, got to home, and then the next day we're just wasted. And um, we had pulled a trailer with us, and so we had all this stuff in our trailer to unload. And the next day, you know, we locked everything up at night and then get up the next day and we're like, you know, we got to like redo the house basically. And so we're unloading all this stuff and getting all this stuff figured out and set up. And um, we sat down and ate lunch. And like, as I sat down to hear this tap on the gate, they always use like a key or a coin or something. They just bang on your gate because it just makes this annoying sound. Like, you have to answer it. And they'll just sit there until you do something. And they know you're there, right? And so uh, I was just content to eat lunch. <laughs> Crystal was like, you got to go talk to them. I'm like, no, you got to go talk to them. So I, uh, I got up and I went outside. And, and so here's this sweet little family, um, m- mom, dad, and a baby. I always got to bring the baby. And... And they tell me their story, and I don't remember their story, but they were, trying to get, they were trying to get back to mom and dad somewhere else, northern Mexico or something like that. And they're just like, man, we just, need, we just need help to get on the bus. Can you just help us get on the bus? And it costs like 10 bucks to get from anywhere in Mexico. And um, I mean, I was just really, really not missional, pastoral in that moment. I was tired. Give me a break. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> and so... Um, I don't know, I don't even know what I did, but probably I just said, see ya, and they left, and I went back inside, and Chris was like, what do they want? I told her the story. She's like, you jerk, go back outside and tell them to come back, and so, um, and so, because my wife has this incredibly generous, caring, compassionate heart that I don't, merciful heart that I don't have, um, we, we help them, and, um, we constantly get in that mode where we're just like, I, don't, I just don't have time. It's not that we don't have resources. It's that I don't have time, and I don't really want to. I mean, Jesus, go back to my verse here. I mean, Jesus says this. Um, love others as well as you love yourself. Like, if it was me standing at that gate in, in that heart-wrenching position, holding my baby, wondering what the crap am I going to do next, what would I want me to do for me? I mean, that's really what we have to look and ask of this. We can judge all day long. And the reality is, is that it doesn't really matter what people's stories are. I mean, that's what we get. That's what we get to is we start making up our minds about what their story did and how they screwed up their own life. And I don't want to be a part of your problem. I mean, love others as well as you love yourself unless, you know, they have some catastrophic problems that you just don't want to be involved in. I mean, that's really where we get to with this. We start unnecessarily or in our own lives, we begin to judge ourselves and then we go or judge them and we go back to this beginning where we say, love the Lord your God with all your energy and we can say, oh, I'll do that. I can sit in church with the best of them. I can sit there. I can look pretty. I can memorize a verse. I can pray a prayer. You know what Jesus was doing with these people? He was identifying with them like, you've got this down. You say you love me. You say that you like me. You say that you'll do anything for me. But when it comes down to the practicality of people, you don't have, you don't even care. You you don't even care. Um, I want you to know and understand this. You know, we always talk about symbolism in the Bible and what one thing means and what another thing looks like. When Jesus said, love your neighbors, he wasn't alluding to some other purpose. It was literally love people all the time. Everybody, no matter who they are or what they do, just love people. If there's ever a question in your life, what's the plan of God for me? Stop asking that question because the plan of God is people. You won't ever, ever go wrong if you just love on people. Everybody, all the time. Bob Goff says this in his book, when joy is a habit, love is a reflex. I think there's two reasons why we have, to, we have trouble with this. Fear. We're just naturally afraid. What, what if what if something bad happens to me? God forbid something bad happens to me. 
I, you know, again, Chris and I really balance each other out quite well. If it wasn't for me in her life, she would we'd probably run an orphanage in a zoo. But honestly, if it wasn't for her in my life, I'd, I'd be a recluse. <laughs> I wouldn't talk to anybody ever. Twice in our, I think twice, maybe even more than that, but twice in our, in our history, in our 15 years together, we've invited a single mom to live in our home for a short period of time. And I always freak out. You just, you never know. You know, what, what these people, they come from a troubled situation and, and, um, both times have been fearful and such a blessing for us at the same time. You build a relationship with somebody who you just stepped out on and, and risked to love and to hold and to protect for her and the children that she's bringing with her. We get afraid. We look at people and we judge them up and down about all their lives until we recognize the fact that everybody on some level is just a little bit hopeless. And no matter what they do, no matter what they choose, you need to start understanding this. The reason they choose what they choose is because they think that through that choice, hope comes. People are just eagerly looking to choose hope to fill their lives. And if you would help them understand that, listen, all that stuff that you're choosing right now, it's not going to do anything, but I have the answer. I have what you need. I have the hope that you're looking for. And they might not get it the first time. In fact, in our huddle this morning, I said it takes probably 700 times for people to hear hope before they recognize that's what I'm looking for. I told our serve family this morning that somebody's going to walk through those doors for the 700th time today. And they're going to hear hope for the first time and recognize that this is what they need. And then my question for you is, is that you're the one sitting next to them and will you give it to them? I don't have time to go through this. In fact, I need to already be done. But 1 John chapter 3 talks directly about this. Don't love in just word. Love in your action. Do something about it. Um, and isn't it amazing how that children can do this far better than anybody else? They just are just unrestrained filters. They don't, they don't care. In fact, I think that so often in our lives, we build in a, a filter of fear into our children because we are just afraid. My son Grayson, the other day, Crystal had to go to a, a doctor's appointment. Oh, that's new, right? No. They're, they're tapering off, but they're at the doctor and they're talking. And, and because Crystal is just so intensely loving towards people. She's asking this receptionist, you know, about her life and about her story. And Grayson is there with her. And Grayson says something about going to McDonald's. And she's like, oh, I love McDonald's. I don't know why. Anyway, I love McDonald's. And so um, they go to, and, and Chris was wrestling with this the whole time. Like, I should just, we should just buy her lunch. Let's just buy her lunch. And, and so she asked Grayson, Grayson, should we buy her lunch? And Grayson just big smile. He loves to love people just loves to love on people like that. He just If this boy was just unrestrained, he'd give everything away. It was It's just so good. So they went to McDonald's, bought, bought like the office lunch, came back and gave it to him, and they're like, they're just broken over there. Like, why would you do that? Just, just because. Man, this is, this is not crazy. This is not ridiculous. It's just love. It's just people. So fear and then facts. The fact is, is that you and I are just busy. We're busy people. We have filled our life with so much stuff that we don't have room anymore. We don't have room. And because we don't have room, now I have a reason to say no. One more time. Let me look at these verses. Love the Lord your God with all your energy. Now, does, does that take time? Does it take time to love the Lord with all your energy? And it says, love others as well as you love yourself. Does that take time? Then how can we have filled our lives with so much other stuff that we don't have time? So my question then, do we really love God? He says this. This is it. This is my tweetable right here. Get out your phone. All the thanks I need for what I did. Dying on a cross. 
that moment, all the thanks I need for what I did is that you treat the person in your closest proximity like they died for you. Let me say it again. All the thanks that I need for what I did is that you would treat the person in your closest proximity like they died for you. What if we started looking at people like that? What, what, if, we, what if we just opened our eyes and recognized that there's a community right here, right here, that is looking for hope that you have access to? Church, you don't need principles, commandments, don't need, you don't need to be reminded of this. You know it. Love God. Love people. Same level. No difference. So my challenge to you today is to stop loving God through your church attendance and start showing him that you love him by loving the people that he created. It's as simple as that. And that's why I have balloons today. I felt like you just needed a tangible reason to give something away. These balloons are not for you. I want to give you an excuse to give something away. In fact, you, if you read through Bob's book, he talks about, he's like, if I ever question what I should bring, he said, I just bring balloons. He takes balloons everywhere. Just give a balloon to somebody today. I, we were in McDonald's parking lot the other day. Kids, McDonald's. This guy comes up and he's like, how many kids do you have in here? I'm like, 57. He's like, well, I don't have that many balloons, but he gave all my kids balloons. They were over the moon with it. Man, can you give a balloon today to somebody? Can you do that? Well, here's the trick. If you can't, I'm giving them to your kids, and they will because they're fearless. Let me do this. Why don't we pray together? Your head's bowed and your eyes closed, and I want you to do this. I want to ask you where you're at this morning. Right here in your seat online, on your couch, wherever you're viewing this message today, um, I want you to make a proverbial offer, altar, wherever you're at, in your heart, on your knees, I don't care, because this is one of the most, the toughest spiritual truths that you and I could ever face. The only way to accomplish this is through action. You can say that you love God and nobody will question you, but you can't say you love people without showing them. Every day you and I encounter people who just need to be loved. You can't tell it because a lot of them have a very, very hard facade they wear. It's like a shield to protect them. The spiritual decision you need today is to make a word of confession. God, I've just not loved people like they're the ones who died for me. Would you just take a moment and just pray over that? As a prayer of confession, God, I just need to see people the way you see people, to love everybody always. God, I want to just pray over this church. Lord, that, that this place would be the catalyst that begins to relentlessly God forward. Lord, help us to see people the way that you do. Lord, with your head still bowed and your eyes closed, are you the, the person who walked in here and heard hope for the 700th time today? And you needed to see that. You needed to hear it. This is your, this is your experience with a relentless Savior who just loves and loves and loves and doesn't stop loving. Is that your story? We, we're here. Our church is committed. Our mission is to help you take your next step with that, whatever that is, and maybe today your step is to recognize hope and to claim it for the first time. If that's your story, whether you're here or whether you're online, would you just raise your hand? Would you just tell me, man, Kevin, that's my story, that's my life, that's where I'm at today. If that's you, and you need to make a decision today to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, I want to just invite you to that. It's as simple as an admonition. God, I believe that you sent Jesus to die on a cross to save me because I'm a sinner and I claim the gift of Jesus and salvation. That's it. You confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you are saved. Whether you're here or whether you're online, I want, I want to help you, encourage you to make that choice today. And then I want to ask you to make one other step. I want you
you to tell us. Stop by the hub if you're here in our building, if you're online. Uh, just say, hey, I'm, I'm making this decision today. Or message us and say, hey, I, need, I made this decision. I want to know what to do now. Let us help you take your steps on your walk as you find and follow Jesus Christ. Hey, can we just shout out some celebration for this God of ours today? It's so good. It's so relentless. When it comes to these two commandments, to love God with all that you are and to love others, is one harder for you? As you go into the rest of your week, how can you use exactly how you were made and exactly where you are to show the love of God to someone else? Let's pray that God would let our hearts connect with His and that He would show us how our feelings reflect His feelings. Let's draw near to Jesus this week. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Grand Point Church Podcast. Your next step starts here. To learn more about us, visit grandpoint.church. And if you're enjoying this podcast, we would love for you to share it with a friend, leave a review, or use the hashtag GPC podcast. We'll see you next week.